In these 10 years of the Belt and Road between 2013 and 2023, the Chinese engagement in investments abroad, in productive investment, has surpassed the one trillion dollars. It means one million of million dollars. It's a lot of money, 60% of which was used in construction and the other 40% in manufacturing. So basically, with this trillion dollar, China has been pushing the development in other countries. If we consider how much is the military spending of the US in 2022 it was 1.5 trillion dollars, about 1.5. So it means that the US is spending 50% more than China invested in developing the world only in military in one year. The military spending of China is less than 300 billion dollars in 2022, adjusted by the Stockholm Institute for International uh, peace research. They uh, adjusted the, the figures of the military spending for the world, so they increased the estimation of the military spending of China. And even using those numbers that are higher than the figures that the government uh, reports in China, the military spending per capita of China is 0.6 times the average per capita in the world. So China is spending per capita, means per person in the country, half of what the world spends in average. And guess how much this is for the US? It's 12.6. So the US is spending way more than China is spending per capita. How can the US accuse China of increasing its military spending when they, you know, you compare how much they spend per person in, in their country and the US is more than 24 times the spending that they have in, in China. More than 900 bas ba military bases across the world. My biggest learning of being here is China is ready to experiment. You try something, if it works on a micro level, you expand it to a more macro level. You try something and it fails, you reevaluate, you rethink about it. You, and mm -hmm. that is a, an image of China that you don't get in the rest of the world. The fact that China is willing to try, fail, readjust, mm -hmm. that it's always reassessing, always reevaluating. So we wanted to learn how, what are the processes that enable this? Um, and I think that's the biggest lesson we could take in the global south. So mm -hmm. seeing how China is more flexible, more mobile is, I think, uh, an important lesson for us as a methodology, not necessarily as a model. Hello everybody, welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. Either you notice or not, the world order is gradually shifting. We are truly facing profound changes that are unseen in a century. For Western nations, domestically, they are struggling to revive their economies and managing the rising discontent and divisions. Internationally, they are losing their grip on maintaining their superior positions and losing the appeal to developing nations. Meanwhile, developing nations or Global South nations are rising to the global stage, demanding a new world order. They will no longer be plundered, exploited, or intervened, but treated as equal, independent, sovereign nations. And among these countries, China, which is now rising economically and technologically, is a major driving force. So, how does Global South nations see the world? How does Global South nations see China, see Western countries, and what's their goal on the global stage? In this episode, I invited two guests from two continents, Africa and Latin America, together in Beijing to share their views of the world. So, sitting on my this side is Michaela Erzcock. She is researcher with the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and also editor with the Dongsheng News. So, Mika, welcome to the studio. Thank you for having me. And this lady is Gisela Salernandez. I okay. hope I pronounced your name right. It's perfect. <laughs> and she is an economist from Argentina and also a researcher with the Global South Insights. So, welcome to the studio. Thank you for having me here. So, you both participated in conducting this very important, crucial report, hyper-imperialism, uh, dangerous, decadent new stage. And this report thoroughly analyzed the evolution of imperialism and how the US-led military bloc shaped the current global order that we're living in. So I'm wondering, what's, what's the drive of conducting such uh, a report and what message you trying to convey? Shall we start with Mika? Sure. Um, thank you again for having us. We are so excited that we finally got this report out. We 
Basically, as you know, something changed and really felt more concrete after October 7th. When we saw the reaction of the Israeli military and how they've raised the Palestinian population, raised the Palestinian infrastructure, completely gone on this bloodbath, unseen, at least in real time, you know, uh, for, for this, for the history of humanity. We were in the middle, like, I think we were like in the middle of trying to like really understand how do we characterize the current world order? Who is with us, as in who's on the side of humanity and who is against it? And what we increasingly saw, as you've covered it, many others have covered it, is that there seems to be an international division of humanity where Ukrainian refugees get treated different from Palestinian refugees, where we can literally watch children starving, dying. I think it's around, about a month ago, it was around almost 400 Palestinian families. And the average Palestinian family has around 10 people in it. So we know the, the big figure is 30,000. But if you think that four, over 400 or almost 400 families have lost at least 10 people in their family, it's incredible, it's, it's insane. We've never seen this level of brazen violence. And so what was really important for us is we wanted to, one, for those who are on the side of humanity, we need to be more clear about who is with us, who advances humanity, who advances development, and who is against the advancement of humanity. And what we saw increasingly, because those of us who are like progressive thinkers, people on the left, is sometimes we talk in generalities, but we haven't necessarily characterized with a greater precision, with a greater factual basis, what is the current nature of what we call the US-led military bloc. And we basically grouped it in 49 countries. Historically, um, those who are closest to the US are those with military and intelligence. And you find countries like Sweden, where I have family, that you know they seem to be the nice social democrats, but they've increasingly been more and more right. And this has an actual historical basis. It's not just one crazy guy. It's in a historical process that we're seeing the global north more and more subordinate, or the countries in the global north, more and more subordinate their individual and national interests to that of the US. And it's because, of course, they are inter, what do you say, uh, interdependent. We were looking at the German stock exchange. More than 30% of the two different studies, but at least 30% of it is foreign owned. And another 20 or 30% of it is uh, unknown, which is likely to be foreign owned. So many of the countries in Europe have subordinated their political, their economic, and now we're seeing with the expansion of NATO in the last two decades, their military interest to that of US foreign policy. So one, we wanted it to be clear, like who, whose interest does the US actually have in hand? Because you know, Biden and all these people, they're coming to elections, so now they'll say, no, we wanna support people, we wanna, you know the usual, we're gonna democratize the world. But increasingly, they exert that power, not through a progressive politics, but through military subordination. And of course, the battle of ideas, where they have this kind of monopoly in how they can completely control and manipulate the media narrative that not only goes to the US and Europe, but many of our countries in Latin America, in Africa, are hugely coordinated by different European and uh, American media houses. So we, one, wanted to understand what's the nature of this geopolitical moment, but two, we didn't want to despair because, you know, we believe in humanity. I come from a background of working with activists in Africa, and we're always trying to advance the social development of our people and of peoples across the world. So we also wanted to think about this term global south which maybe for the last 10 years has been quite in vogue, quite in fashion, but it has lacked precision. I mean, there was even a report from the Japanese foreign ministry, I think it came out, must be the 2021, like, I think they called it the Blue Notebook, their outlook on the world. And they mentioned Global South a couple of times, but it lacks precision, like who is this Global South? So even though I think we're only entering, I think we did quite well at trying to define um, the Global North, uh, because if you look at how they coordinate their economies, their military, their politics, it's very much an us and them. And uh, we were talking earlier about the statement made a year ago in the European Union, the European Council and NATO, the heads of those, uh, you know, Jens Stoltenberg and all those horrible individuals, they made a statement last year. This is before, you know, we're, we're even getting to October 7th, where they said basically, to paraphrase, that they would employ all their economic, military, and political means to protect 
our one billion people. So they see the world in a divided terms, that there is an international division of humanity. And so even though they are concrete, they're a block, they are coordinated, we also wanted to give a bit more precision to this concept of Global South and try to think how do we group the different, you know, even if they're loose, even if they're emergent, but what are the commonalities beyond just saying the broad, we were the former colonized world, but think about what are some of the thematic uh, common interests that different groupings are galvanizing around. And so we try to think about who are the ones um, advancing a socialist agenda. That was one theme. The other was who are fighting for their sovereignty, which is countries uh, like Iran, like um, the countries in the Sahel that are fighting against the French, who are those who are leading that question around sovereignty and who are maybe the prime targets on the CIA's coup list. And then we looked at other groupings because we didn't want to make the Global South just feel like this mixed, in South Africa we say mixed masala, like this just pot of many ingredients. We wanted to think about how we're going to better identify certain tactical areas and then think about how our people, our social movements, um, intellectuals, etc., can start to debate these things and try to think concretely how can we go forward because, as you know, even organizations like BRICS, whilst they represent an important break from US and Western-led multilateral, not only the ideas of multilateralism, but the organization, we know that there are a lot of limits because within the BRICS there are different huge ideological divisions. Um, that don't necessarily all walk in step with one another, but we wanted to still think about what's the ways in which we can give precision to the global south and also make sure that we're clear on what our limitations are in terms of humanity, because at the end of the day, and Gisela, you did this research like in a lot of detail, is the military power of the US-led military bloc is, is quite astonishing. And, mm. and you should probably speak about that a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, uh, some things to add. I think that out of this report, we have three main takeouts, which are related with the spheres of hegemonic power of the, the West or the global North, as Mika has defined recently. So if we analyze these three spheres, these are the military power, the economic power, and the political power or the institutional power. In the military power, it's the, more, the most uh, astonishing uh, sphere. Some figures are just uh, stunning, which is the military spending of the world, if we divide them by countries, and then we consider this integrated military group of the US, uh, the NATO, and European countries, this camp is completely led by the US, they represent three quarters of the world military spending. So out of the $2.8 trillion that the world spent in 2022 in military, 74% of that <laughs> came from the US-led military bloc. It means that the military is taking a very important role in this stage of the imperialism in the world. And this has a specific reason to be, which is first, historically, the Global North powers have been based, uh, uh, their, 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 their growth, their wealth accumulation, their, their industrialization has been based in the exploitation of the Global South countries. So the teeth of the colonies, the slavery, they all were the base of the capital accumulation of the Global North. And the military is the mean that they use to defend those, uh, those systems. So the slavery is not today as the mean that they use to, to, uh, to capture wealth, but they still use the military to threaten the, the countries. And it, I think it's very, uh, it's very clearly expressed in some figures that we have in this report. The US today has 902 military bases outside of his, uh, his country in the world, and that's a clear figure on how important the military is for the Global North. And the second reason why the military is important is because they are losing power in the other two spheres of influence. In the economic terms, we, if we check what is the GDP, which is the gross domestic product of the whole world, if, and we measure this in purchasing power parity, which means that we are considering all the prices uh, the same, we remove some distortions, not without uh, discussions, 60% um, of the world product is in the Global South. It's no longer in the Global North. And we are, if we consider the Global South excluding China, that's an argument that many countries have, still the Global South is surpassing the Global North. So there is a growing process, a leading process of the Global South in the, in the world economy that has no longer the Global North as the main actor. 
And for instance, in the, the manufacturing, in the industry, if we want to have a concrete example, the Global South today represents 70% of the manufacturing uh, value added in the world. That's a stunning figure that explains why the West doesn't have that uh, tool of control on the manufacturing in the Global South. And then in the institutional power or the political power, we have a group of more than 40 countries that belong to three uh, more vibrant organizations, which are BRICS with a development agenda, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization with a security agenda, and the Friends of United Nations Charters with a political agenda in defense of the, the United Nations. These more than 40 countries belong to th these three institutions. Of course, separately, they have more countries belonging to, to each of them. And they are those that are leading this debate or, or this agenda or advancing this agenda in socialist development, advancing the sovereignty, advancing the development of each of these, uh, these countries. So I think these are the three main takeouts that we have. The declining power of the West in the industry uh, field and economic field in general. The declining power in terms of institutions and the growing power in military are three key elements of today's world. Add one yeah. small point because I didn't actually say the title of the study is it's called Hyper Imperialism, a Dangerous and Decadent New Stage. Mm. And part of why we called it that and in the beginning, we, our, our working title was like um, super, super imperialism. imperialism. But then we had this debate with other people in the world and we realized this is not, I mean, there's a historical tradition where Kautsky wrote about super imperialism, but we didn't want people to think it was super like Superman, like it can't be defeated, right? And that's why we came to the conclusion that it's more hyper imperialism because though it has certain hegemony in military and some military technologies, it is losing you know, economic, political legitimacy. And because it's doing so, it's acting hyper, it's acting more exaggerated, more frenetic, which sometimes is more scary when you have a wounded animal because it can just do anything. But simultaneously, it gives us this feeling of it's in decay and there's opportunities for us to make certain advances because they're losing certain power. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to raise the title if anyone wanted just to check it out. Since you're, you're explaining hyperimperialism, what, what does the term hyperimperialism mean? And why do we need to be cautious about that? Does that mean more dangerous? Yes, I mean, I think as we've seen with what's happened in in the Israeli genocide in uh, Palestine and occupied territories is that at this stage, because of its economic and political hegemony over a longer period, it has been able to act with impunity. The US-led military bloc and the US itself has been able to act almost with impunity because it's gained a certain monopoly in different areas. And we've seen that because they can kill whoever they want to kill in Africa, they can coup whoever they want to coup, mm. they can threaten people. We have the records, we have the information, but nothing happens in terms of there's no form of disciplining them because they have that military hegemony. And so when we're talking about hyperimperialism, we're talking about a historical process in which they gained con or companies and institutions in the global north gained a certain monopoly over certain areas of finance, production, etc., through processes of slavery, colonization, neo-colonization and subordination of uh, the working people, the peasantry in the global south. But at this stage, it's acting in a way we've never seen before. And again, this is why we chose the word hyper, because the, the word means an exaggeration, means acting with almost a frenetic energy. Um, one of the lines we used in the study was, it's like a, a man, a billionaire who's drowning, but still is trying to like save his sinking yacht. Like there's something that seems a little bit like it's towards the end, but because they're drowning, they could do anything. And that's why we have to be careful. A dying snake, probably the most venomous. Yes. They will do everything to destroy whatever they think is threatening their life. Exactly. Right. And if you get bitten by that venom, you know it can be lethal. So uh, it's not again to scare anyone. It's just that we felt like, especially we work with progressive organizations across the world, we have to have an accurate assessment. And we were thinking about this before what, October 7th, and we can see already that this is 
a clear example of what it's capable of doing and how it can invade impunity. But it's important for, especially, I'm, I'm sure you saw over the weekend, it was huge um, mass protests. It was an international day of solidarity mm -hmm. with Palestine. We had 50,000 people in New York on, you know, the Yemenis are, every Friday over a million are in the street. But what's important for most of the countries who, especially the people who are living in the global north, to know that your country spend so much on military when there are people who are in student debt, there are people who are working several jobs, there are people without health care, etc. That I think helps people to understand that to fight for the self-determination of the people in Palestine is also to fight for the reinvestment and the changing of investment into mm -hmm. social spending, not into military spending, into peace and not into war. Mm -hmm. We all know that the United Kingdom, traditional war, Western European countries and uh, America have militarily intervened in many countries. But the report showed us the exact numbers. Like, like you mentioned, the United States have over 900 military bases across the world, yes. not outside of their ter territory. And during its 200 years of existence, it invaded, well, used armed forces that they acknowledged in 101 countries, I think. Yes. That's the countries that they acknowledged that we didn't count the Asian wars. And the United Kingdom invaded 170 countries yes. in the past few hundred years. I mean, the numbers is shocking. I, mean, you, I think that's also the value of the report, is showing us how militarily threatening that they are to the world. Yet, in their media, they are describing China as expanding their military budget is threatening. Well, the, the report also shows us that China's military spending is much, very behind the U, US, UK, and uh, European countries. So I know this is your expertise. Tell us <laughs> more about that. Well, some, some figures about the military. As you pointed out, the US and the UK have largely used the military force for, as the base for their expansion. And they, ironically, or hype, with hypocrisy, they accuse China of increasing the military spending. But let's check on something. China is now the second largest uh, nation in the world in terms of population. With 1.4 billion people in its country, the military spending of China is less than $300 billion in 2022, adjusted by the Stockholm Institute for International uh, peace research. They uh, adjusted the, the figures of the military spending for the world, so they increased the estimation of the military spending of China. And even using those numbers that are higher than the figures that the government uh, reports in China, the military spending per capita of China is 0.6 times the average per capita in the world. So China is spending per capita, means per person in the country, half of what the world spends in average. And guess how much this is for the US? It's 12.6. So the US is spending way more than China is spending per capita. How can the US accuse China of increasing its military spending when they, you know, you compare how much they spend per person in their country and the US is more than 24 times the spending that they have in, in China. And this is because the US, for example, has more than 900 bas ba military bases across the world and China doesn't have it. And these are figures that we should uh, explore, we should understand what is happening with the military in the world because as we mentioned, this is not for being you know, scared or just resisting at home and saying we don't aim to change the world because the US and the Global North have the military power, but to be aware of what uh, what is a key feature of this stage of hyper-imperialism. So some, some comparisons that are very interesting to understand, and I think this is um, related to what is the role of China in today's world, um, in these 10 years of the Belt and Road between 2013 and 2023, the Chinese engagement in investments abroad, in productive investment, has surpassed the $1 trillion. It means $1 million of million dollars. It's a lot of money, 60% of which was used in construction, in construction and the other 40% in manufacturing. So basically, with this trillion dollar, China has been pushing the development in other countries. If we consider how much is the military spending of the US in 2022 it was $1.5 trillion, about 1.5. So it means that the US is spending 50% more than China invested in developing the world only in military in one year. 
that's the dimension of the military spending of the US. To be clear, they could invest this uh, half of the, mili the military budget that they have in a year in development in the world, and they will really change the reality of the peoples. But they don't do it because the military historically has been their strength and because they have, they have gone so far with the military that they can't just simply say today, we are going to reduce the budget, we are going to reduce this military race that we are pushing in the world without major resistance. So that's why the people's resistance in each of those countries pushing for a social agenda, saying less spending in military and more spending in health, education, housing, can really change the world. Mm. So that reminds me of the uh, the comment from U.S. Ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns. Uh, he said to Australian media, 60 Minutes, he told the anchor, we don't want to live in a world where China is the dominant power. And it was like, first, China never said they want to be the dominant country in the world. And actually, through the multiple work reports from the government, China's message has been very clear. It aims to narrow the gap between global north and global south. They want to build a a world, a shared a community with a shared future for all mankind. And so like, uh, why you think China will be a dominant power? And second, what does the US ambassador mean when he said, we, we don't want? And I'm sure he refers to like, you mentioned in your report, the US led European nations, the global north countries, but I'm wondering how does the Global South see such comment or see the world? Um, maybe a start from you, Mika? Because of the economic pressure and of course because of the space that has been created by China's support with the BRI in the last 10 years, with um, the, the increased engagement. I mean, I think China has some of the highest high level invitations to African leaders um, like a bigger number, I, I can't recall exactly, I think it was between 2009 to 2019 had over like 200 high level political meetings where I think uh, African leaders were feeling politically prioritized and seen as equals whilst, you know, you remember when they bust all the Africans into the, <laughs> the Queen of England's funeral and whenever they have a meeting with Africans, they're always almost chasing China who starts the year by going on its like five or six country tour, which is a historical legacy of Premier Zhou Enlai and the period where um, Afro, Sino Asian, I mean, Sino African relationships were really being built out of this common feeling of independence, sovereignty, decolonization. So I think that right now it's people feel insulted, even the most, and by no means are the leaders on the African continent necessarily. Um, all advancing the, 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 the interests of their people. By no means, we have a lot of internal domestic struggles that we have to go through, but we are hopeful that it creates certain types of cracks and openings when African leaders are willing to say, like in the recent Munich conference, the Munich Security Conference, the chair of the African Union Commission, uh, Faki Mamat, he said something along the lines of, we can't keep going along with this previous system that seems to continually indenture and exploit us. So they're actively saying this. And then of course, we, those of us who are looking for a more progressive agenda, we've seen in the last three or four years how we've had these popular uh, coups. What we, we call them captain coups in Tricontinental because it's not a coup for power of the one colonel to another colonel. It's these younger captains who are closer to the general population and actually it's the population who have pushed for this and they come to support the agenda of the population. Um, I was listening to Vijay Prashad who's the director at our institute talking about the difference behind what happened in Tahir Square during the uprisings in 2011 in the Arab world, in the Arab region in North Africa. The difference between it and why it failed and, for example, why the Russian Revolution succeeded in 1917 is when the general population has these spontaneous kind of rebellions or protests or demonstrations where they exercise collective power, leadership is required not to impose your ideology or your ideas on the people, but to see how you can best 
facilitate the advancement of the people's needs, how you can best synthesize and you know, push forward the advancements of the people's needs. So whilst we can, we even seen conservative African leaders stand up and say, we're actually not buying this from the West anymore. What's been more exciting is to see these younger leaders who are coming in supported by mass movements, by mass swells of the people, and who I've seen, I'm sure you've seen the, the leader from Burkina Faso, uh, Traore, uh, he is also returning to these ideas from Thomas Sankara, who was the first president and leader of the independent Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso means land of the upright people, the people who've stood up. Mao talked about how China stood up in 1949. So there's this return to how do we salvage our sovereignty for our development and do so in the, in the, with the aim of advancing dignity of the people. So those are the, some of the two tendencies. But I will warn and say that even though there, a lot of African leaders have shown more of an aversion to quickly going along with Western agendas, there are many of them who are doing it from an opportunistic, self-interested uh, perspective. I mean, the Zambian president, one minute uh, he was in the US, oh no, he was in China first last year. One minute he's in China making deals, next minute he's going to the US to say, look at the deals I just made with China. So there are people that we in Africa need to hold accountable to development agendas and interests um, because there are very many who are still opportunistic. Mm -hmm. The first thing to, uh, to, to mention about this point is that the Global South is not an homogeneous group. You know, as Mika mentioned before, we have different groupings with different characteristics, but the first thing we can say about the Global South is that it's very diverse. So the agendas that they have are also diverse. Thinking about the de-dollarization, thinking about the multilateralism, thinking about the industrial development, are points that are more or less in common in the Global South, but the way of achieving these points or reaching this, this goals is quite different among them. Referring to this, this world dominated by China, well, my understanding is that China is not aiming to dominate the world, but China is a growing power. China has shown an enormous economic transformation over the last, uh, the last decades. And I think that the main fear or the main uh, concern of the West is that this will be the first time in more than 500 years that an economy that is not led by white people is leading the world. So China has already surpassed the US economy if we consider purchasing power parity terms uh, about 10 years ago. But if we consider the current dollars, the current terms, which means each country uses their own prices to measure the GDP, well, China hasn't surpassed the US yet, but it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen within uh, 10 years, 15 years, if you want to delay it even more, but it's gonna happen. And it's something that the US and the Western countries can't stop. This is gonna be the first time in history that a country, not only that is not white, but also a country that has based its growth in its own production and not again in the slavery, in the thief, in colonialization is going to lead the world. And that's the main concern of the West. How this growth is presented to different global uh, South countries is quite diverse as well. Some of them can see in China an opportunity, can see some examples of how to lead a process of economic independent development in your own country. And some others just see it as an opportunity of you know, having investment, having funds, and are actually aligned with the US in international politics. So this um, bullying that the US is doing on the Global South countries to align themselves with the Global North policies against China and against Russia, in some cases is actually effective. We have plenty of examples in the Global South about, about this, but we also have some others, as Mikaela was mentioning before, that when it comes about votations in the UN, they are voting with the Global South. They are voting for the ceasefire in Gaza, they are voting um, for the peoples and not voting with Israel, the US and, and the European countries. So I think that China appears not only as, in some cases, an example to, to study and to not copy and replicate the policies, but at least understanding how the independent development process happened, but also as a leading force in the world, showing that you can, in fact, have an independent process of development without the use of the violence, which is what the West has done for the last 600 years. Mm. 
I noticed one thing is now there are people from around the world from different countries moving to China either to study, to travel, to live here. Several years ago, it probably the most of foreigners are from, say, European countries, North American countries. But nowadays, I see more people from Latin America, Caribbean, and Africa, and Arab nations moving to China. So there are still a lot of people from different countries moving to China, but the origin countries are changing. So meaning more developing nations, global south nations, this nation, people are coming, moving to China. But it, it kind of in line with the current uh, international relations we're seeing, uh, even though U US, Latin, US, European nations are seeing China as a threat, uh, but uh, countries from these regions are joining BRI, joining BRICS, and choosing to work with China, be friends with China, and they want to come here to see what's happening in China and understand China. Like you two, you two also moved to China. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering why there's a growing interest uh, from Latin America, from Africa, from uh, Arab world, from around the world, trying to understand China. Well, initially when I was coming, it because I was interested, we were all interested as in how did, how did you become number one or number two in the world in a relatively short period of time? Because, you know, um, the US, the UK, they all took centuries, you know, to dominate the world and do so without going out and seizing territories, enslaving people, etc. But then when we came to the end of uh, 2020, there was this announcement of China was able to eradicate extreme poverty, right, and, and lift Oh, in the last couple of decades, 800 million people out of poverty, extreme poverty. And it shocked me, it really shocked me that this was not a headline in Africa. This was not like big news in one of the, you know, poorest continents with the youngest population that has so much potential. One of the poorest, most, you know, resource rich in terms of natural resources, in terms of mineral, mineral resources, etc. that this wasn't big news. And so part of that is that we wanted to understand, A, why isn't it big news? Like, what is keeping us apart? And try to figure out ways of engagement on a people-to-people -people basis, and also by starting to connect a little bit better, because we know language is a big barrier. So we wanted to be able to also speak to Chinese people on Chinese terms. So we also started a process of working through journals and through political discussions where we have you know, translation and things like that. So we can actually know what is the debate in China? What are they thinking of their own development? Not the mediation through Western media as historically has been the case. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other aspect is, well, why don't we know this information? Then of course, how did you guys do it? Yeah. And not because anyone wants to copy, but the fact that it was achievable in a country 70 years ago was amongst the poorest countries in the world, where the life expectancy was, what, 35, 36 in 1949, um, similar to many African countries, but now is around, what is it, 84, 85? Seven, seven, you know, more, but seven, actually eight. in the 70s, by 79, had almost doubled. Mm -hmm. And, in, and that, that was also an interesting period because a lot of people now attribute China's rapid development to only a specific period. You're either the left and the rest of the world, you're either like a Mao person or you're, uh, um, Deng Xiaoping person, or you, you, you're like, no, that was the correct way, that was the correct way. But coming here it, and learning more about the history, learning from other people, learning just by seeing how elderly, I've never seen elderly women anywhere in the world have such a high quality of life. <laughs> I've never seen so many older retiree women go on independent travel groups to Dali, to Sanya, to you dancing, know, in, dancing in the square. weekend, <laughs> singing in the weekend. I've never seen that because most African people, if you're not looking after the grandchildren of your children who have to work somewhere else, you're out there hustling, even though you're you know, past your retirement <laughs> time because everything is to survive. So being here, it's only then that you get this qualitative or better qualitative sense 
of how exactly China has advanced this form of development and, and what have been some important processes. And that includes having like a strong political direction. It includes having a people-centered agenda. But I think most interestingly, and this is why I raised the leftists and the rest of the world or progressives are sometimes a bit obsessed with a particular phase of history as more right than the other, is my biggest learning of being here is China is ready to experiment. You try something, if it works on a micro level, you expand it to a more macro level. You try something and it fails, you reevaluate, you rethink about it. You, and mm -hmm. that is a, an image of China that you don't get in the rest of the world. It's a static, very racist, like ancient China, you know, wisdom and that you guys are all calm tea people and like all these <laughs> horrible things. I remember the first time I really thought about China was when I was in my final year in high school. It was a New York Times magazine, it was 2010, and it said the rise of the dragon, something like that, you know, something... It's still, economists, I think a few months ago, they have a cover with yes, the dragon circulating, gra 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 grasping the whole <laughs> earth. <laughs> like, it's wild. It's not the case. <laughs> but it's still this kind of, not seeing the motion and the, the fact that China is willing to try, fail, readjust, mm. that it's always reassessing, always reevaluating. So we wanted to learn how, what are the processes that enable this? Um, and I think that's the biggest lesson we could take in the global south because mm -hmm. what's that saying? I hate when people use it, but you know, they say if you, something about if you make a mistake once, if you do something, you try something once and it's a mistake, it's a mistake. But if you keep repeating the same model, then it's insanity. Right? Mm. You keep doing the same thing or hoping for a different outcome, then it's insanity. And it feels like the global South countries in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, have been forced into this corner and told that this is some new way, but it's just the same IMF, you know, World Bank wrapped in different paper that just reinforces dependency, reinforces underdevelopment, doesn't enforce uh, the protagonism of the people and how to reorder and restructure society that has endured. And so mm -hmm. seeing how China is more flexible, more mobile is, I think, uh, an important lesson for us as a methodology, not necessarily as a model. Mm. Very well said. Yeah. I came to China in February 2020, so Ooh. about four years now. Very, very interesting process. And I live all through the pandemic here. So it was very interesting to see what the Western media was saying about China and how the things were in China. So it was really sad actually being here and seeing how in the rest of the world people were dying on the streets as, as it happened in, in many cases, or people were you know, in a lack of care from the governments about the health. They, people were forced to go to work, exposing their own life to, to the risk. And I was in China thinking, well, I'm in the safest place in the world to be just now. Despite all the complaints that the media had, we were in the safest place in the world. So I lived all that, that process and it enabled us not only to carry out that research that Mika was saying, but also living empirically certain things, um, such as the freedom that women have in China. And it's something that is very interesting because in, we can read in the Western media many things about women in China being oppressed, being super racist as well, right? Like ancient uh, treatment of women. And actually women in the street here work with freedom. I come from a country where I cannot walk in the streets at 11 p.m because I'm exposed to a high risk of being not only robbed, but kidnapped, raped, or even killed. You know, it's, it's very dangerous for women in, in, in the world being, being at night on the streets because the society is super unequal, it's super violent, the patriarchal system treats women as objects to be, uh, to be taken and destroyed, while in China it doesn't happen. So leaving these this concrete examples and can, can, can understand what the process that the, the Chinese society has been gone uh, through is very interesting and it's very important to communicate this to, to the world. These are stories that I don't read in Chinese media. I live it in person and I can tell how women live in China, not only the elder people and this freedom that they enjoy, but also young women in, in the country. And then when it comes about economy as well, which is my, my main field of, of study, um, well, my experience reading in uh, back in my country was that there was 
a sort of praise to a certain period of time in China, which is since the reform and opening up, overpricing the market reforms as the market like the only solution to the problems, leaving aside the fact that the government in China has always worked with market and the state and the socialist market specifically or the market with socialist characteristics and the government and the state are comp uh, all the time uh, interacting with what is happening in the market and that process has to be studied and has to be told in the way that it was because there is a confusion in the west about what happened with the chinese uh, model of economic development and some interesting not even a confusion a misrepresentation, <laughs> misrepresentation. an obscuring a hiding <laughs> that's a better description <laughs> thank you <laughs> of what is happening with the chinese model so being here as a person from latin america studying what is what are the challenges for the industrial development in China? It's just an impressive opportunity to, to live. And I think there is a historical comparison that is very interesting. When China was, um, was taking this process of economic reform and opening up in the 70s, in uh, Latin America, we were suffering the counter-operation pushed by the US. The counter-operation was an orchestral plan by the CIA to basically overthrow the leftist and progressive governments in the region, to kill all the communists they could kill, and eradicate all the process of independent development that were taking place in the continent. So these two things happened in parallel. China was having independent development, and the US was destroying the development in Latin America. Of course, it was under the Monroe Doctrine, which says America for the Americans, mm -hmm. understanding Americans as US citizens and not the whole continent. And that process interrupted all the industrial development while in China was being uh, peacefully being taken. Now, almost 50 years after it happened, we have the, the results. We've seen the results of Chinese development and China can share it with the world, not only for this process that has to be started to you know, overtake this, uh, to overcome these uh, misrepresentations of China, but also to share it with the world in a win-win strategy, which is what China is doing through the Belt and Road Initiative. Latin America has now the opportunity to you know, share the fruits of the Chinese development, and that's another threat for the, for the Western countries. They cannot um, control the Latin American economies as they did in the past, because now they have a strong economy that they couldn't control during the 70s while they destroyed Latin America. So being here is a sort of... Uh, bridge road between my continent or the continent I belong to mm -hmm. and China, which is my second home now. I think your report tells something really important is that we all need to be careful because the dying empire probably going to do everything they can to destroy the world we're living in before they died. But still, there are alternatives that all nations, other global south or people in global north as well, uh, are pursuing a different model of development mm -hmm. where they can treat it as equal, their living standards can be raised, and I'm sure a new world order will be emerged. How we do it remains to be seen, but... The harder this, question. Yes. <laughs> we will continue to fight. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you so much for sharing with me, and I really hope you gals can come back to the show. Let's do this more often in Beijing. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us both. Thank you, it was Thank a pleasure. You. Read the report. I will put the link of the report in the description, so go check it out. Hey, have you signed up to my weekly newsletter yet? I've created a weekly newsletter on Substack. If you prefer reading news, if you prefer reading news about China and other international pressing issues, if you want to look beyond the mainstream talking points, make sure you subscribe to my newsletter. You will have your news delivered to your email. Do you want to be a content contributor as well? If you want to get your articles, your stories, your perspectives being published, let me know. Here is my email box, jjnewsletter at hotmail.com. Let me know. If you prefer watching short videos, you can find me on TikTok. My name on TikTok is I am Li Jingjing. If you prefer interacting, discussing with people from all over the world, you can find me on Reddit. My subreddit name is News with Jingjing. 
If you prefer watching long videos, you can always stay here on YouTube. And you know, I'm very active on Twitter as well, right? I will put the links of all my platforms in the description. I've been working as a journalist in China for more than 10 years now. I report stories related to China and also other international issues. But voices like mine are often being neglected, censored, or even attacked by Western mainstream media. I don't know, maybe one day, this Western companies probably want to erase me from their platforms. So it's very important that you subscribe me on multiple platforms so you can always find me. Thank you so much for supporting me for such a long time. See you next time.